I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less travelled by, and that has made all the difference. I took a decision, either I could be very successful in my career in the medical profession, and I guess become very rich, or I could try to make a difference to humanity. When the girl comes to Sunta Secondary School, we always emphasize the development of the heart rather than the head. Jamila got a lot from her mom also. Her mother uh, joined a group of ladies who did social work in the hospital. So I think from the early days, both at home and in the school, Jamila had um, example. We used to have a thought of the week here on the corridor, which said, words are sound, example is thunder. We grew up in this extremely diverse background, and I was the last of all the children. My father was, um, by the time he had me, I was, he was a retired civil servant and, you know, very much a reader, a person who encouraged us to speak well and, you know, read widely. Um, my mother, on the other hand, was this, you know, really not well educated, but extremely smart, entrepreneurial woman, very defiant, very strong, who had gone through a lot in life. Uh, you know, and then met my father and her life turned around. So one of the biggest and earliest childhood memories I have is our house in Jalangasing was a single story bungalow and a long hallway. And <laughs> I would wake up at night and see people sleeping in the hallway and turn to my father and say, who, who are these people, you know? And he'll say, oh, that one came from Johor, is looking for a job. This one is a whole family we're taking care of. This one, you know, he's, you know, all these people who would come and my parents would always have room and have food for them. One of the things also that I think shaped me was when my father died and I had to be extremely independent because my mother then going off to, you know, run a business and so forth. And one strange thing that she did to me was every year at the end of the year when the school holidays came and I was maybe 13 or 14, she'd actually give me a bundle of money and a ticket to Singapore and make me look for some of the relatives my father had who weren't so well, you know, so less fortunate than us. And my task was to make sure the children had school books and school shoes and school uniforms and then I could come back. I was really, you know, for a 14 year old being packed off every year, I kind of like, used to ask my mother, you know, did, you, did you not like me? You know, was I so difficult? It was very rebellious as a child. So, you know, said, why you send me off? And only when, you know, just before she died, she actually said to me, I always knew you were different. I was watching television with my son and, I, you know, I kept saying, well, I wanted to help in this disaster in North Korea and, you know, Bosnia and everything and I never went. And I was actually sitting with him and he was five years old watching the news. He just looked at me very innocently at five saying, well, you're a doctor, why aren't you helping them? And that really, you know, I said, he's absolutely right. This is something I've always wanted to do and I, there's no excuse now for me. I told her that why, why don't you start your own organization that, you know, you bring back the, you know, uh, the uh, experience and also provide a platform to Malaysian, uh, you know, who want, want to do all this uh, good work, you see. So I always joke, as I have a very obedient Muslim wife. My husband tells me to start an organisation. I start an organisation. I met Jamila uh, in off and on. Jamila was a, uh, an emerging figure in the humanitarian world. Having founded Mercy Malaysia, which turned out to be one of the most interesting non-governmental organizations, representing something that one really hadn't thought and understood sufficiently, and that is 
How do NGOs outside the Western-dominated sector really cope? What can they do? What can they offer? And I certainly think that Jamila gave all of us a very clear insight into what that could be. When the um, news of the earthquake broke out, everyone was focusing on Phuket. We called our emergency operations meeting, we sat down and I said, you know, there's no news coming from Aceh and the epicenter is just off the coast. I bet you everything's knocked out, so why don't we make our way there um, and then send another team to Sri Lanka. So that's what happened. We you know, just emptied our warehouses and, and you know, really bit the bullet because it was a time that we didn't really have that much funds. But I remember saying to my team, you know guys, if this is it, this is our last mission and we close shop, we'll do it really, really well. When I arrived in Aceh and in the hospital itself, I think there's so many dead bodies and I can see that um, people are trying to, to ask for help. I'll straight call Dr. Jamila and I, I mentioned to her that this is actually the worst ever uh, mission that I've ever been. And I, I actually, I don't know what to do. You know, when I arrived in Aceh, it was uh, a little bit shell-shocked, to be honest, because it was as though, you know, this huge bomb had dropped on Aceh and everything was completely wiped out. And, and I had never seen boats on buildings and, you know, bodies everywhere. Um, still, you know, fresh and some were decomposing and people running around trying to look for loved ones. And it was just so surreal. And, you know, I still, I'm still haunted by some, you know, memories. Like there was a child that was, you know, my son's age who collapsed and came in and he had, you know, just mud and debris in his lungs, you know, just calling out for his mother. And as I was resuscitating him, you know, I, I thought about my son and I actually had to stop and, you know, get someone to take over and just moved away and wept for a while before coming back. You know, it was just, the, you know, the needs were just, just so overwhelming and yet there were so few people there. Ketika tsunami, sekolah kita ini rata di bawah tsunami. Kemudian kita belajar di tenda, uh, numpang juga di masjid. Kemudian ketika itu uh, Dokter Jamila datang ke masjid menanyakan uh, lokasi sekolah kita yang lama di mana. Dan ketika itu kita memang belum ada uh, NGO yang datang ke kita untuk membantu. Kemudian Dokter Jamila bersama kami rame-rame para bapak ibu dewan guru membawa ke lokasi sekolah ini kemudian melihat dan Dokter Jamila akan membantu pembangun sekolah ini kembali seperti itu. Kami karena ada di rumah-rumah beberapa rumah karena tempat tinggal tidak ada sehingga Dokter Jamila mengambil keputusan membuat tenda. One of our young doctors was captured on CNN. And, and this was transmitted across the world, saying, you know, Muslim Malaysia had these doctors in the hospital and they were treating these patients and so forth. And I think probably that was a tipping point for Muslim Malaysia. It was what triggered you know, really our growth and uh, the brand awareness uh, globally and locally. And more importantly, I think it really pushed us to realize that if we were to sustain beyond me, we need to really invest in being an extremely professional organization. Managing disasters is not just about giving assistance, it's about thinking how you connect the dots and how you find the best people around you that will help you, you know, come up with a really, really good result. And at above all, always respecting what the government authorities and local people feel and making sure they are part and parcel of the solution. She found me in Aceh, she believed that I have this potential to do more uh, for my society and she felt the need to 
to mentor me. She believes in young people and she wants to nurture them. And because she believed that if she could help me, maybe through me, I can actually help others more. And that's actually Dr. Jamila. It's very important to Jamila that the local people become part of helping each other. And so she works a lot with volunteers. Uh, it's very important to her to, to empower volunteers, to train them, to use them in the work. She's also very pragmatic in developing local solutions that are, that are creative and not necessarily just providing aid, but provide empowerment to help people help themselves. We work with local masons, with, with the government agencies, with international organizations, with business sector, trying to tell them that, you know, we need to think now that we're not going to rebuild risk. And that has been my mantra for the longest time, that it's not just about going in to give assistance, it's about making sure we leave communities stronger than they are, and that we need to build resilience. Jamila, um, I think, is a rare species in a way. Um, she has something very particular, which I think is very special. Uh, and it, I think it's in her DNA. Um, not only is she a very kind person, I mean, everybody would say that about her. I mean, she's one of the warmest personalities I know. Um, but in fact, she is also um, someone who represents and who lives humanitarian principles and humanitarian values. She not only understands what their current sufferings are and their needs are, but actually be able to see beyond and give them a direction and hope. A really interesting part, because of her work in Mercy Malaysia, uh, Tan Sri Jamila is actually in the current textbooks. So when she went into the classroom, all the kids and teachers got really excited about it and the kids asked her to sign their uh, textbooks, you know, because like someone you're reading in a textbook is suddenly showing up in your class to talk about their work. So that was really inspiring as well. I think the most uh, memorable one for me was uh, in Bam, Iran. And that was early days for me and I had just gotten to know her. And it was three weeks into the mission and she called and she asked what we needed. I said there was a lot more that we needed to do. And I told her that uh, we have to secure uh, permission to continue with our work and immediately she made the decision to say you know she, she decided and said okay I'll go there and help you when she came in and the minute she walked into the tent the man was suddenly you know uh, open to the fact that Mercy Malaysia was there and she sat and spoke with him and and you know assured him that we were here for the long term we wanted to you know rebuild the community and immediately we got the permission to actually stay on so that was memorable in the sense that you know that was the first time i witnessed how you know jamila could actually uh, bridge that that uh, uh, the relationship with even the toughest of uh, authorities i remember one day when dr jamila called me in, 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 in when I'm in Banda Aceh and told me, Azam, uh, when are you coming back to KL? So I said, why Dr. Jim? No la, I just want to see you. She told me that uh, she wants me, she wants to take me for lunch and, 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 and she wants to treat me in KL CC. So I said, okay, why? Why you want to, to do this? Because I that time, I'm, I'm, I'm very, like, very sad for me, for uh, uh, a person like, like Dr. Jamila, who really want to take care. He knows, he knows, um, like, like, I'm already three years for me to, to stay in Banda Aceh. It's very hard for me to sometimes to, 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 to really think of what is actually best to do sometimes in life. And she, I don't know how she knows that, that, that time that I'm, I'm thinking like that. And she, like, like what I've said, she's like mother. She feels that she, she listened to us. In 2009, on my 10th year as uh, the founder and president of Mercy, I decided that it's time for me to step down. But it's never easy. 
it's like having a child and letting go. But I knew it had to be done. And I was looking around for something to do and, and the opportunity came up that I was, you know, was basically headhunted for this job in, uh, as a chief of image and response at UNFPA. And after two years, I thought, you know, no, this is not for me. It's a, it's a great learning experience, but I'm very much action oriented. People ask me what I do now and sometimes it's really hard to, to explain. Um, I guess I don't have a fixed job. I know I am a visiting senior fellow at King's College in London at the Humanitarian Futures Program. I also am a senior fellow at Kazana uh, National Burhat in its Kazana Re Research and Investment Strategy. I think much of my time is spent really sitting on many boards and advising and also trying to influence um, change in organisations. My next role really is, as much as I miss being in disaster sites, I think I need to download my information and knowledge in my head. I need to build new leaders. I, I need to play a role now in influencing change, um, influencing governments and other international actors and national actors and really start writing my book <laughs> at some stage, you know, um, and documenting the journey that I've been on and uh, hopefully inspire younger people. I suppose everybody knows that when she went to Iraq and they were attacked on the road and uh, the bullet that went through her colleague lodged in her, instead of being admitted in the hospital, she carried on and she left the bullet inside and even delivered a baby and waited till she came back to Malaysia. To me, that is really living her motto, her school motto. Ad veritatem per caritatem, which means to truth through charity. And are very proud of the fact that one of the, our past pupils who has lived this most fully is Dr. Jamila Mahmood. One of the things that always if, makes me quite happy, but in a sense also sort of surprised, is how many people I know from my own office, people that I uh, work with, talk about Jamila in a most positive way, almost as if there was a kind of light uh, that guided them to her. So, so, I don't know what drives her. I think that would be unfair for me to even try and guess. But I do know that wherever and whatever drives her, her impact has been extraordinary. It hasn't come without a price. You know, I know how many birthdays I've missed and eat celebrations and, you know, you, you miss the years sometimes that your kids grow up, something like they're grown up in front of you and, you know, I always say to them, I seek your forgiveness for that, but I hope you realize that, you know, you have to share me with the many million children that don't have a mother to look out for them. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. And that's how I feel right now.